Hello, everybody. Dave Bush on the show today. Boston Red Sox major league pitching coach, but he's got an unbelievable experience. Can't wait to get to him. Uh, before we do that, don't forget, I want to thank all our listeners on Facebook Live. If you got any comments, any questions, especially about base pitching development, development of the game, just type at the bottom of the Facebook comments there. And thanks for joining us in the U.S. and around the world. Thank you. We'll have the show on YouTube and also on our podcast, BaseballOutsideTheBox.com. And remember, Twitter at BaseballOut. Looking forward to talking to Dave. And Dave's got a tremendous amount of experience. I'm not going to go through everything, but he's been a pitching coordinator. He pitched in the big leagues. Um, story has it he didn't throw very hard, but I'm not sure if that's true. We're going to talk to him about that. And that could have been a benefit in his, in his teaching. He played in Korea. Um, he was with MLB with the Envoy program. He's done work in uh, China, South Africa, and he was a pitching coach with the Chinese national team. We're going to talk about that because John McLaren gives him a big shout out, and I got some things to ask him that I went after I talked to John. So let's welcome Dave Bush. Dave, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, thank you. Everything good? The sound good? Yeah, we're we're doing okay. I uh, certainly wish we were playing right now, but all in all, we're doing okay. Absolutely. And you can hear me fine, right? Yes, I can. All right. Fantastic. All right. Listen, uh, well, tell us. I know you, you said mentioned you got three kids. I'm not, I don't know if they're in baseball, but, um, you know, your recommendation, what are you doing first daily, you know, as a pitching coach in the big leagues? You know, you got to keep yourself sharp, obviously, and you also have to be ready. What are you doing daily as a routine that helps you get it, you know, get into that routine later as soon as, you know, MLB opens up and things start rolling? Sure. I'm trying to keep uh, up with things as much as I can. I talk to my pitchers probably once a week, sometimes a little bit more often. I have guys that send me videos that are throwing programs from time to time, uh, asking for some feedback. But really, it's keeping track of my guys, trying to make sure they're throwing, that they're doing enough right now so that whenever we do start up again, they're ready to jump right back into it. And that's that's tough because there's, there's a moving target. Uh, I don't know when we're going to start. No one else knows when we're going to start. So we're trying to stay ready without doing too much. Um, and, and it's a, a constantly adjusting process right now. Absolutely. And there's a lot of communication between you and the pitcher still going on? Yes, quite a bit, at least once a week, if not more often. Absolutely. And what about your kids? You got your kids. Are they in sports or what are they doing daily? What are you trying to keep them doing? So that way, because, again, if they're in a sport, they may be going playing, you know, as soon as it opens up. Yeah. It, ordinarily, they'd be starting Little League right now. Um, they yeah. all play baseball and, and um, you know, we're, we're trying to keep them occupied at home, which is a, a little bit of everything about different activity every 10 minutes or so and we're mixing in some homeschooling at the same time uh, it's tough they they would rather be with their friends and, and out playing games but we're my wife and i are doing our best to be creative and try different things right now absolutely hey folks forgot to tell you this can be a challenge for me because first of all david wake forest graduate psychology and sociology major um which is great and then also pitching he was in pitching development and the analyst for analytics for the Boston Red Sox for many years. So we're going to get into the analytics. We're going to get into, I'd like to talk a little bit about later, um, you know, effective velocity, how that's used a little bit in pitching. Um, but before we do that, let's get into um, a little bit about, you know, I was told that in high school, you went from a catcher to a pitcher. And I wanted to ask you about that transition. Did that help you in being a pitcher? As, did it help you later on in being a, you know, a pitching coach? Sure. It, uh, I was a catcher all through, you know, middle school and high school and and got recruited as a catcher to college and then um, had pitched a, a tiny bit in high school, but, you know, a handful of innings at most. And I got to college and, and I realized pretty quickly I was not going to be a good enough hitter. That yeah. I could catch and throw fine, but I, I just I, I, I had hit my limit as a hitter. I just I, I couldn't keep up with the velo and the better stuff. And I realized pretty quickly that if I wanted to be on the field, it was going to be on the mound, not behind the plate. Uh, so I made the transition the fall of my freshman year. I uh, did a little bit of both that spring, but but after that, it was just pitching. Um, and, you know, in regards to my development, I, I had a lot to learn. I was starting from from ground level. At that point, I had, had no pitching instruction up to that point. Uh, but my awareness of the game from from being behind the plate and being a position player definitely helped. It just helped my, my bigger picture view of what I was doing out in the mound. Absolutely. And a little shout out to Andy Bergler. I want to thank him for connecting us. Um, and he's the one that told me about, you know, you being a catcher and a, and a, and a pitcher later on. Um, now, it, obviously, spending those years in the big leagues, uh, first of all, was it true? I mean, it, it, you didn't throw very hard. Um, you were 6'2", you know, pretty big, pretty big guy, uh, didn't throw very hard. And, and if, if that's true, it had to help with your 
development later as far as when you're teaching other guys that don't throw hard or or or, or, or even sometimes could it hinder with guys that threw real hard to try to help them oh, yeah i was i was probably an average right-handed starter for you know 10 years ago when when velos were not 95 and above like they are now i would sit 90 91 and and that was kind of standard i was a four pitch guy four to five pitch guy um learned how to mo- make the ball move how to work different parts of the strike zone i had to be creative I had to know who the hitters were. My scouting reports had to be ready and accurate. Um, I just I had to be well rounded as a pitcher. I just I didn't have any singular skill that I could fall back on, so I had to do everything pretty well in order in order to survive and succeed. So uh, you know, as a coach, I, I can draw on a lot of different things. I, I had to do um, a little bit of everything. Like I said, I had to learn how to do all the different aspects of pitching, um, and so it was an important part of my development as a player, and it's helped me as a coach that uh, I try to like to think that whatever issues my players are facing, uh, I have some experience to draw on. If not personally, then from a teammate I had or a coach that I had. And look, every guy is different. Every one of my pitchers has different needs and, and different things they struggle with and different things they do well. So it's up to me as a coach to be able to adapt my knowledge and my teaching style to whatever their needs are. Yeah, I remember Tom House telling me, and I, you threw 91, 92. That's pretty good in those days. Um, you know, Tom House mentioned he threw 85. You know, he was left-handed, obviously, um, and he became a great pitching coach um, and, and an expert in, in the science of it. Now, what about when, you know, you've got pitchers that throw at high velocity, but also you want to balance that with movement, control, moving the ball around. How do you work with guys that are thrown really hard, but yet want to teach them the things you just talked about that you use that got guys out and that can possibly put them at a higher, you know, make them even better? Sure. It's uh, it's expressing to them the, the importance of those different aspects. Um, hitters nowadays in the big leagues are so used to facing velocity that it's simply throwing 98 or even 100 by itself is not enough anymore. Yeah. There's a period of time, you know, certainly during my career, where if you threw that hard, you could get away with it just because of the velo. But hitters see it all the time. Um, so the, the the more prevalent that kind of velo is, the less it actually matters. It's uh, in some cases the harder you throw, the less it matters because hitters see it all the time. And and the game is shifting back a little bit more towards the the control, command, and movement uh, that we used to see more often. And even guys that throw hard have to be able to to stay out of the middle of the plate. They have to be able to locate the ball. They have to be able to make it move. Um, so sometimes it takes failure for, for those guys that they have to get hit around a little bit. Other guys are more open to different ideas. Um, but I've got certainly plenty of suggestions ready whenever guys are, are open to that. Dave, what's your recommendation to young players that, are, that hear a lot? You know, you've got to throw hard or you're not going to advance. Now, I'm not talking about just advancing the big leagues, but any level. you got travel teams, guys to throw hard. And I get it. I mean, velocity is important. There's no doubt. I mean, if you throw harder, it helps. But what's your recommendation? Where, where do you start? Because where do you balance it? The velocity, the control, both? Um, you know, where does it all start? I think that there's a time and place for all of it. There, there are times of the season and times of the year where, where we can focus on building strength and velo. And then there are other times we have to focus on performance and actually pitching and getting people out. Um, you're right, man. Velo is important. It matters. Um, the harder you throw, the, the more room for error you have. Um, it's it's just the way the game has gone. It's the way it's gone professionally, and that's filtered down to amateur levels also. Um, but it's still not the only thing, and, and there's a lot of risk involved. There's a lot of people getting hurt, especially mm-hmm. kids, because they're trying to throw too hard too soon, and their bodies aren't ready for it. So I really do believe there's a the balance. Uh, yes, you know, throwing hard is important. It matters. Um, but it, it cannot be at the expense of health and and actual performance on the mound because, there's the, the, you know, the game is littered with, players that throw really hard and don't have a whole lot of success. Uh, so and there when, has to be balance. And when you were a minor league, you know, pitching coordinator, um, the velocity aspect, um, was that a development that the players did on their own in the off season, or is that continue to try to increase the velocity, you know, in, like in spring training, uh, you know, in the off season, do you have a hand at that? It's become more of an off season thing. Um, mostly because, in, especially at the pro level, they're, they're pitching so often. If you're a starter, it's every five or six days. Um, and it's it's really tough to build velo when you're also trying to go out there and pitch that often. Absolutely. So, so you know, it, it's not it's not a it's not something we prescribe for all of our pitchers. But for the guys that do want to do a, a velo program or do want to do a weighted ball program or anything like that, 
it's become an off season thing because that's the time where they can build the strength without also taxing their arm by pitching too much. You know, and I'm curious uh, when you talked about velocity, uh, weighted balls, you know, strength, those are two aspects. Are there other aspects that allow a pitcher to increase their velocity? Things maybe they need to work on that, that will is the overall package. It's not just the weighted balls. It's not just the strength. Yeah. Well, we're shifting more recently. We're shifting to the biomechanics where, uh, you know, it's a step beyond traditional pitching mechanics and it's, it's building a delivery and a mechanical style based on how the individual body moves. Everybody's body is built differently. We have different amounts of flexibility and strength and, and, um, you know, momentum in our body. And, uh, you know, any, any body type can be successful, but we have to, to understand exactly what each guy is doing before we can really help them out. So the biomechanics and, and the tracking and measurements uh, are allowing us to see how each guy moves and, and where his efficiencies or inefficiencies are. So we can fix some of that stuff, too, without actually tackling weighted balls or anything else. But just by getting the guy to move efficiently and naturally, sometimes we'll see a bump in velo there, too. You know, I don't pretend to be an expert in all this stuff. I mean, I spent a lot of time with Tom House, got a chance, was really lucky to learn a lot from him. Um, Spent a lot of time in Japan. You played in Korea. Um, I've always wondered because I always said, you know, the the Asians, you know, they're not very well in Korea. They're a little bit bigger, stronger, but in, in Japan, not as big as and strong. They play a lot of long toss. You know, yes, they overdo it. There's no doubt about it. But they also biomechanically, if you were to look at them, I would think they would be close to the top. Um, they're proficient. They're experts in everything they do. And they've all and you see a lot of Japanese. You know, they may not throw 96 all of them, but a lot of them throw pretty hard across the board. It's not just five guys or six guys. It's all of them. Your experience in Korea and, like you said, the biomechanical aspect, what did you learn? Did you learn something from being in Korea? Sure. It's a, you know, it's, it's a different style of game over there. Um, the, you know, the, the pitchers are not just because they're velo, but they, they just pitch differently. And, and there are definitely things I learned. You know, Most of my career, it was pitch down the zone, try to get movement, and have the ball hit on the ground. And that's not always the case, certainly not the case nowadays in the U.S., and, and it wasn't really the case in Asia when I played. Uh, they were more willing to work the top of the zone. They, they, you know, they, they pitched up in the zone with, with fastballs that worked, even though they may not have had huge velo. Um, so, uh, you know, may, maybe they're ahead of us a little bit on that. Maybe it was just a, a different style that developed there. But uh, there are a lot of things I learned uh, about the game that were different and also very successful there. Were there things that you, you learned there that allowed you to be a better pitcher? Was it anything about conditioning or training or anything they did that you took into the U.S.? Um, you know, I, I was at the tail end of my career, so I'm not sure there was a lot that was going to help me that much. Uh, mm-hmm. There were things that, that, you know, certainly would have been helpful earlier in my career. Uh, just the awareness of different parts of the strike zone and different ways of pitching that worked. Um, also, the, the hitters, are they have a different approach at the plate. And so I had to learn to adapt what I was doing. Um, you know, I, I couldn't just pitch the same way I did to American players um, because uh, the Asian players have, you know, a, a different approach to making contact and different, uh, a different part of the zone they're trying to cover. Um, so really, just, it made me a, a more well-rounded pitcher. I, I had to learn more stuff. Even at that late stage of my career, I had to be very open-minded to um, playing the game the way that they did because I couldn't force my style on the game. It was being able to adapt my skills to the way they play over there. Absolutely. We're going to tell you a co- couple questions on Facebook. One you kind of addressed, so it would, you know, if you just want to briefly address this, Mark Megger, what are your thoughts on the weighted balls? I personally love them, but I have to be careful and not to overdo it. Um, I'll add to that, especially with young kids. What's your, what's your uh, impression there? Well, it definitely needs to be monitored. Uh, that there's a lot of misperceptions out there about about, you know, th- simply throwing a heavier ball is going to make you throw a baseball harder, and it's not that simple, and it's not true. Um, they're the well done weighted ball programs are very effective. They're, they're strengthening all parts of the arm and the shoulder and the elbow, um, and allowing you to throw harder because the whole mechanism is stronger. Um, but uh, there's still a lot of people that, that think if I just throw something heavier, I'll throw a baseball harder. And I think that's where a lot of injuries happen is, is simply by, and it's not just kids. Uh, there are some pro players that struggle with this idea too. Um, but being unmonitored and just picking up a ball and not really understanding what the program is designed for can lead to trouble. But done correctly, I think there's a lot of benefit to it. All right, we'll take Andy Schultz, a high school program. Do, uh, do, do not let our, they don't let their freshmen throw a breaking ball, but part of it is arm 
health, but primarily it's because we want our kids to learn how to command a fastball and develop a changeup, a pitch we we value a lot. We've been we've seen benefits for, with some of our kids for sure, but wondering your thoughts on this approach. I don't have a singular approach to it. Uh, I would definitely agree that, that being able to command a fastball is critically important, no matter what level you play at. Um, you know, whether it's teaching changeup first or a breaking ball first, or or allowing kids to do both. I would say it depends a little bit on the kid. You know, some bodies are built and and work very naturally and smoothly to throw changeups because uh, because cer- certain pitchers can get their hand on the inside of the ball very easily. Other guys really struggle with that movement and they work the outside of the ball a lot better. So for the guys that work the outside of the ball, it's going to be much easier to throw curveballs and sliders and cutters because that's the way their hand naturally moves. So I would, I would hesitate to force anybody into a certain style. Um, other than knowing that, that yes, that the fastball command is critically important no matter what love you play at. And when we work beyond that, it becomes a little bit more individualized. You know, you mentioned clearly earlier about body types. I'm sure there's hand sizes. Um, you know, when you look at pitchers, you know, I, I know in the big leagues, a lot of these guys already have certain pitches. Um, but when you look at prioritizing pitches for certain pitchers, um, is there a priority? Obviously, you said fastball control that first. You know, even for young kids, second pitch, you know, curveball changeup, does that depend on certain things? Because uh, that's a question that comes up a lot. Yeah, it depends on really on body type and, and how they move. Um, you know, we, we have made, made those mistakes in the past in the player development part of minor league baseball where we, we've asked a guy to throw a certain pitch for, you know, a couple of years in a row and he just can't seem to make any progress. And then later on, we realized it's because of the way his body moves. He has certain limitations that are probably going to prevent him from from really developing that pitch forever. And so now we're a little quicker to shift on to something else, to a different pitch type or a different grip um, or, or a different approach to it so that we don't waste quite so much time trying to teach you guys something that he's probably never going to be able to do. Um, but it takes a lot, of, a lot of trial and error there. We, we made some mistakes along the way, but we've also had some successes too. Dave, when you're talking about pitches, is there a, uh, with your pitchers, are you looking at certain velocities, certain differences in velocities and, you know, in those pitches and maybe, maybe mention what those variances are when, when it comes to the different pitches? Sure. There's, um, you know, there's the movement difference, there's velo difference, um, there's how pitches pair together. So obviously, you know, pitches that, that move and work in different parts of the strike zone are going to complement each other nicely. So a fastball that, that moves up an arm side is going to pair with a, a slider that goes down and glove side because they're kind of going diagonally across. A cutter that, that stays a little bit flat and goes glove side is going to pair with a changeup that goes down an arm side, again, because they're in opposite parts of the strike zone. Uh, but there's also the velo difference. You know, be, being able to have a slider that's hard enough. You know, if it, it, let's say a fastball is at 95, if your slider is at 80, with a little slider shape, it's not really a slider anymore. That's a, a curveball with a small break because the velo is so different. So the, there's there's a matchup of movement and velo difference and zone location that matters when you when you talk about the total package of what a guy's doing. Uh, and that's where you look at the, the big picture for a pitcher and say, how's he going to use his stuff? You know, and obviously you've introduced analytics into the Boston Red Sox. I believe reading, they brought you in specifically for that. And, you know, and as a major league pitcher, that helps a lot because you've pitched in the big leagues. Now the analytics, now as a pitching coach, also in the minor league system, I mean, you bring a lot to the table. Um, was it easy to introduce that to all the other coaches when the very first time? Because I've heard times where, you know, they introduce and some coaches are a little bit hesitant because they, they're not familiar with it. Sure. It, it was not easy. Uh, but most of my first year was spent off field um, trying to introduce these concepts to to coaches and a little bit to players and also to understand it myself to make sure I had a full grasp on, on what I was trying to teach. Um, there was some resistance, but, um, you know, not, not in a negative way, just a, you know, the, the coaches wanted to make sure if they were going to accept something new that, that they fully understood what it was about and that I fully understood what it was about. And what it came down to is, is making sure, you know, as I figured out, making sure they understood that these are not necessarily new concepts, uh, but we have more accurate ways of measuring what's happening on the field. Mm. So instead of simply relying on our eyes or what we think is happening, we can make measurements and match it up. And then we can, from that point, we can train our eyes so that we know what we're looking at and we know what a fastball with a certain movement profile looks like. And we know whether a guy is truly getting a sink on the ball. And we know whether that cutter is actually cutting or whether it's just kind of backing up a little bit. 
Um, so being able to accurately measure these things and then tie those numbers to the, the concepts that the pitching coaches already knew. Like I said, in a lot of cases, these were not new ideas. It was just a new way of looking at the same ideas. And that, that connection took a couple of years, but, but um, I think that the coaches saw the value in it. And the players were all for it because each, each new wave of younger players has been exposed earlier and earlier. Absolutely. And when, they players, when they had players asking for it, the coaches realized they needed to be able to answer some of those questions on their own. Yeah, where does a, a high school coach, you know, college maybe a little bit more advanced, they got more more funding and so forth, but where does a, where does a coach start with a program like this? Um, you know, you're practicing maybe a month before the season starts in high school, a little bit longer in college. Where do you begin to kind of work with the players on the biomechanical aspect of it and their pitching and then introduce the analytics along with it? Where does How do you mesh those two together? Yeah, it's it can be tough. It, it's a step by step process. A lot depends on what you have access to. If it's a high school program that that doesn't have access to a whole lot of information, then there are lots of different different um, educational sessions that you can learn from over the winter. Whether it's being in person at a convention or or doing some of the online courses, um, they really give you a, a pretty broad understanding of some of these topics. Whether it's biomechanics, whether it's pitch data, um, linking all that stuff together. It's really just growing your knowledge base. That, that's a huge, it was a huge part for me. It's a huge part for anybody um, is really understanding what these concepts are so that when you do try to implement them, you're doing it correctly. In that way, whatever you have access to or whatever kind of players you have, you can choose the right approach to it instead of trying to do it a, a one size fits all. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, listen, we got a question from Greg Bronze from Saskatoon, Canada. Um, he's a good friend of ours. We do an ISG coaches program there every year. Um, you know, this is a question, I think a general question, is there a place or course where coaches can take training on, on analytics of the game? And where does Major League Baseball, where do their coaches go to learn all this? Well, for Major League Baseball, we, we do it all individually. It's up to each organization. Some things we do, at least with the Red Sox, some things we do internally. And also we, we sent out most of our minor league coaches, if not all of them, to a variety of different programs and conventions over the off season that, that mm -hmm. we send someone to, to almost all the different events that happen. We send a coach or two because uh, that's a chance for all of us to learn. Um, there is, there's not a, a single big thing for analytics. It's, it's such a big term and such a big field now that it really depends what part of it you want to get into. If, if you want to really focus on the biomechanics, then that's one second. If you really want to focus on, on uh, you know the, the pitching approach and sequencing and tunneling, that's another segment. If you really want to focus on understanding TrackMan data or Rapsodo or anything else, that's a different segment. It would be impossible to learn all that at once mm -hmm. uh, for, for several years now, and I'm still learning all the time. Um, so I think just, just finding the topic that interests you is a great place to start because that'll get you in on the ground floor and allow you to grow your own knowledge and, and learn from there. They do the Boston Red Sox when they get a young uh, pitcher in the minor leagues. Uh, there's a whole uh, analysis done on their body, evaluation of their strength, flexibility, all that stuff. Kind of explain what your your process is there, because then you've got to be able to teach. But you, if you don't know those facts, that could be difficult. Also, as you mentioned, different body types and all that. Yeah, it's that's one of, we do it every year. Not just when a guy first comes into the organization, but we do it every year. We do measurements on their kind of a, a movement screen to see where their, their areas of flexibility or tightness are to see if they have any deficiencies in strength. Um, it can be a, an easy way to identify some injuries or potential injuries. We've seen imbalance in strength and let's say the front of the shoulder versus the back of the shoulder. Uh, the player may not feel anything at that point, but it could be a sign that, that there will be trouble ahead once the season starts. So we're constantly doing that. It's also something that everyone's involved in, the trainers, the strength coaches, um, the sports scientists, the coaches themselves, all of us have a piece in it. Uh, because if there is an issue, if there's a strength issue, then the strength coaches need to be able to attack it when they're in the weight room. Um, if there's a flexibility issue or an injury issue, the trainers need, need to be able to attack it when they're off the field. So it's, you know, it, it, it's too much for a coach to do all of it. Uh, but we all have to work together and we're constantly in, in contact because I may see uh, something with a guy's mechanics on the mound that, that look different or look off. And I ask a guy to, to try to correct it and he can't do it. So then we may go back and look at the physical screening and see, if, is there a deficiency or an issue that has popped up in the past that we can address? Mm -hmm. If it's something with injury, then he's got to go to the trainers first. If, if he's healthy, but there is a flexibility thing that we think can be solved, then this is, you know, maybe he goes to the strength coaches. 
and gets a little bit different weight program for the next few weeks. Um, but that's the kind of circle it goes where we try to identify problems in the field and then figure out what the issue is. And then basically re refer the player to the right person. Yeah. It might be more time looking at video. It might be more time working with me, but it also might be the trainer and strength coach that can solve it. Yeah. And, you know, high school coaches, even travel coaches, they've got all this stuff at their availability in their community somewhere um, if they do the research. So and and anytime you have a question, just email me at Peter Caliendo at ATT net. Be glad to help you and guide you in the right direction. Dave, uh, you know, nowadays, you know, that you're seeing, as you mentioned, you've seen a lot of injuries also because of velocity. Um, what's your recommendation to try to reduce the injuries? Um, you know, we know we can't take them away. We don't, it's not a perfect science, but we're getting a whole lot better at it. What's some of the recommendations you have for coaches to kind of work into the program so you can kind of reduce these injuries a little bit? Well, definitely building up the right way before a season starts is really important. It's probably the, the, the single biggest issue that I had to focus on as a major league coach this year was making sure uh, that I built guys up properly in spring training. Um, again, we used to rely on feedback from players. Hey, how do you feel? I feel great. Good. You can go throw. <laughs> now we have a little more scientific approach to it where we're, we're monitoring their, their workload ratios and, and how many throws they're making in a week versus how many they're making over a month. And we're trying to, to have that be a steady rise instead of spiking um, so that when guys do get out in the mound and you know the, the intensity level goes up and the effort level goes up, we're, we're trying to make sure that we've built them up properly for that. Um, that that's a really important part in, in making sure they get rest between starts. Uh, we're, we're far more willing to let guys back off a little bit. If they feel like they need it or, or also, you know, sometimes making that decision for the players, uh, which can be challenging because a lot of guys want to just keep pushing ahead and pushing and pushing and pushing. Sure. Sometimes we have to ask them to back off. Uh, and that that's also a, a little bit different approach than, than used to happen in coaching. Um, sometimes we have to make those decisions for them because we have a long-term picture in mind and a long-term health in mind. Yeah, and there's a lot of competition. Some of these guys may not want to come out or, or reduce, um, you know, because they're, they're worried about their job sometimes. I'm sure yeah, that, exactly that, right. yep. that could be a factor, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's where the balance comes in. That's that's where the relationship comes in from coach to player. Um, you know, if we're going to take a guy out earlier than he wants to, uh, it's it's important that he trusts that we have his best interests in mind, not just for that day, but for the next start or the next one or any time later on in his career. Dave, nowadays you guys track your pitchers in the off season. I mean, do you use programs like we've had Moda Sleeve on the on the show? Do you use programs like that to track them in yep. the off season? You could talk a little bit about how you do that. Yeah, we, we have some Moda Sleeves that, that some of our guys wear. Um, we're also tracking uh, the number of throws they make, not just the number of pitches off the mound, but the number of throws all the way through the throwing program and trying to spread that out so that they build up properly. Um, the motor sleeve is great because we can, can help measure intensity by the, the amount of stress that they're putting on their elbow. Um, there's no perfect way to do it, and, and everybody's different. There, there's not a magic line of too much stress or too little. Um, but just monitoring those things and knowing exactly how much guys are throwing and how much stress they're putting on their arm helps us individualize their programs as they get ready. More important, massive stress would be in competition. I mean, there's a difference between throwing a bullpen possibly and, and in competition when it comes to the stress level. No doubt about it. And that's that's where the, the motor sleep comes in when uh, we tell guys that, that, you know, whether it's some, sometime in January where they're getting off the mound and they're, they're starting to increase their intensity a little bit, we can get feedback from the sleeve that says, well, this, this is not much higher intensity than you usually throw with or – you had a higher intensity last bullpen session than you typically would. So let's make sure we back off a little bit right now. Um, it's a way to build up so that, that when they do get in the game and have hundred percent effort, we've tried to make sure we've gotten close to that before the game setting. Cause we really can't replicate it. Um, but we try to get as close as we can before they get into a game. You know, also I was thinking, um, you know, I remember in the old days we, we tracked in the bullpen, all their bullpen throws, um, we even, even if we got them up in the bullpen during the game, you, that's all tracked, right? Because sometimes we forget it's not about just the pitching that you did in the game. Yeah. It's, it's all the throws they make. It's, you know, roughly knowing how many throws they're going to, they're going to take in their pregame throwing session. And then also every time a guy gets up in the bullpen, whether it gets in the game or not, keeping track of the number of throws, um, you know, adding in the, the eight warmups between innings, mm -hmm. we can forget about those. We, we look at a guy that pitches eight innings, he throws. 110 pitches, but he also threw 64 more between innings as his warm-up. 
Um, so again, it's just the, the bigger picture view of what guys are doing with their arms, not just the number of throws they make in a game. You know, I want people to hear this at the youth level because we also we have play, coaches listening from the U.S. around the world, different levels from Major League all the way down to Little League. Um, you know, young kids, sometimes we only have two, three pitchers on a staff. You know, uh, it's more important, I think, to try to develop as many pitchers as possible because everybody has the ability to hopefully, even if you're just throwing an inning or two, you don't have to throw a game, but it, the more pitchers you have, the, the better it is for all our players, I would think. What's your kind of thought on that? I, I would definitely agree with that. Um, you know, like we're all, including my own team in the big leagues, we all have our best pitchers. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to rely on everyone else down the line also. And we're going to rely on depth. You know, and at the start of the year, we may take 13 pitchers, but we're probably going to use 25 or, or maybe even more in the course of a season. So having that depth and having the ability for everyone to pitch a little bit as you get into youth leagues, every inning that someone throws is one less inning that your better pitchers have to when they when they really shouldn't be out there. I um, mean, you might be surprised. You, you might develop a kid that, that you didn't expect to that, um, you know, I'll use myself as an example. I didn't really pitch much until I got to college. Yeah. If I'd never had that opportunity, if no one ever let me go out on the mound, then I never would have figured it out. Um, so, yes, yeah, so a willingness and, and an acceptance to let other kids try it and, and to pick those opportunities so that uh, you're not overusing your better pitchers. And, you know, one more question about the youth level, too, as far as, you know, your son. I don't know if he pitches or not, but let's say he wanted to pitch. Um, where would you start with him? Uh, that's a good question. He, uh, neither one of my boys want to pitch right now. They, they don't been much rather hit, uh, yeah, which, is, fun. which is fine with me. Yeah, it's fine <laughs> with me. Um, it's actually easier because they don't listen to much I say right now anyways, when it comes to baseball. So <laughs> well, wait, 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 folks, I'm glad you said that because, you know, here is a big league pitching coach. That's you're no different than any other father out there. Right. I've got, oh, big, no. big league friends of mine that send me their kids to work with. And I'm going, wait a second, you pitch in the big leagues. You want me to work with them? My, my kids don't want to listen to me at all, and, and that's that's just being a dad. There's there's no difference for me or anyone else. Absolutely. Like I'm, I'm actually I'm happier throwing BP to them right now because they, they'd much rather just swing and, and hit. Um, but, you know, if, if they want to pitch, uh, I would definitely take it slowly with them. I think it's important to let their bodies develop without being overused. And, and um, I also think they're going to benefit from learning to throw as a position player. Mm. So they throw athletically and naturally rather than mechanically. Um, when, when we get up to professional levels, sometimes we have to revert back and get away from the mechanics and try to figure out how a guy throws naturally, what his natural arm slot is. But if he were standing at shortstop and picked up a ground ball and threw it to first base, where's his arm slot? Yeah. Because wherever it goes on that throw is probably where it should be on the mound. Um, so that that's what I'd like to develop first in my own kids and in any youth kids is their natural movements. And then we adapt the natural movements to uh, a style of mechanics. Great point. What's Dave Bush's, as a major league pitching coach, what's your toughest job? What's the toughest thing to deal with? Uh, I think it's just the everyday nature of it, you know, trying to balance out a whole season. Um, you know, we, we obviously have very talented players. I have, I have mature players who have been around for a while and know what they want to do. Um, but getting through a whole season is tough. You know, getting them to understand that as a starting pitcher, you're looking at 30-something starts. As a reliever, it could be 70 appearances. And helping them balance that time between appearances and between starts to make sure they're getting their work in, but also getting enough rest and recovery in. Um, it's just a difficult thing. It, it's a hard, uh, it's a hard process because it's it's one of the challenges of the major leagues is is not only being skilled but also being durable and being able to recover, so that you can pitch as much as you need to. Um, so just going through that process and and constantly doing it with with all the different pitchers. Um, it's one of the challenges I'm really looking forward to whenever we do get to start. Just uh, playing that game and the competitiveness and, and trying to put everybody in a position to be successful. You know, you mentioned communication. That's got to be big. Um, you know, not only communication with your players, but now you got Latin players, Japanese players, you got all kinds of different nationalities coming in. Talk about the relationship you have with your players and why it's, how, why it's important to have a great communication with your players. The communication is always important. It has to be. Uh, I think I said earlier that they have to trust that I have their best interests in mind. And and the only way we're going to get to that point is if I invest my time and my efforts into the players themselves. It's one of the things I, I really I learned coaching internationally was being able to deal with players in different backgrounds, uh, different languages, different ethnicities, um, 
even different economic backgrounds. You know, some some guys come from a a privileged background where they're in some cases being challenged for the first time and need some help getting through it. Other guys come from tougher backgrounds where uh, they have no problem facing up to a challenge, but need a little help dealing with it. Um, but just being able to understand that everybody's different, every personality is different, and and everybody's knowledge and education is different, um, and therefore my approach needs to be able to to adapt to the player. Um, but I like that part of it. I really, like I said, I really felt like I learned a lot internationally about simplifying my message, mm. uh, clear and concise, uh, especially when I had to use a translator. Because I mean, there are times uh, in China where the, the translator may or may not know baseball very well. Right. But whatever I was saying, it, it had to be simple enough for the translator to understand it. And also the right message that he could get across to the players and they could know what I wanted them to do. And that's hard. It took a lot of work. Um, but I, I think it really helped me as a coach to to clean up what I'm saying and to to make sure that I get the point across clearly and quickly. How do you read players? Because, you know, you've got a relief pitcher, you know, got a – a setup guy, you got different types of pitchers. Um, how do you read their moods? You know, they, they come out, they come, you know, some guys, they're, they're, you know, their face is the same all the time. You know, how do you know when they're not feeling good? Uh, do they come to you? You've got to be able to see certain, you know, things in their facial expression or something like that. How, how, how do you do that? That's a tough area. It, it is tough. It depends on the guy. Um, I, I, I try to listen a lot too. Mm. I try to be, um, I try to make myself available so that, the players were, are, are willing and comfortable to talk to me. Some guys do it all the time. Some guys come up and, and want to talk every day and, and tell me everything about how they're feeling. Other guys don't. Other guys try to hide it a little more. Maybe not intentionally, but they just keep more things internal. And so I have to know the guys that, that, that internalize their feelings. I have to push a little bit. I have to press a little bit. I have to make sure I ask the right questions. Other guys, I just have to be there and let them talk. And they'll tell me everything they want me to know. Um, but really, it does. It, it depends on the guy. And and those kind of personal relationships are, are what I really like about coaching is truly getting to know each guy, understanding what makes him tick, and then finding a way to make him better. Let me jump to the bullpen because I think this is an important area. Guys that do the bullpens, is there anything different nowadays compared to when you played, you know, that they do differently in the bullpen, possibly to prepare, you know, better for the actual game or to change something? Is there anything different there? I'm not sure there, there's much different when we're actually on the mound in the bullpen. A lot of guys just have a routine that they like. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd say typically 30 to 40 pitches, sometimes a, a couple fewer than that. Um, mostly for the, the bullpen time, it's just getting your body ready. Um, if there's anything that's changed, it's what we do before we get on the mound. The activation routines, the work with the trainers and strength coaches that happens during the day, all that stuff is new. We used to walk out in the field, swing our arms a couple of times, touch our toes yes. and, and do like, you know, a little personal stretching routine and then start throwing. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, by the time it gets, a, by the time a guy gets a ball in his hand and steps on the rubber, he's done a lot of work to get to that point. Um, he, he's been stretched. He's he may have seen the massage therapist. He's done all kinds of different activations with for shoulders and elbows and everything else, or whatever other trouble spot he has, so that the body is fully ready to go. Um, that's probably the biggest change. I think once guys step on the mound in the bullpen, uh, it's you know, hey man, here's your routine. Let, let's make sure you're ready. But all the work leading up to that has definitely changed. You know, I remember going to Dominican Republic a lot. Yeah, a lot of times we, we have a game, you know, 15 minutes before the game, the, the other team would come out, stretch for five minutes, throw some baseballs, and get ready to play. Whole different ball game. But I know things are changing. In the bullpen, um, a pitch pattern prior to a game, is there a pitch pattern that, that you recommend? Or is it individual, obviously, you know, when it comes to preparing for that ball game? Because a lot of young coaches or even kids have no idea. They're just throwing strikes. We're trying to throw strikes in a bullpen and then going through a game. Is there something to follow? I, it's, I, I want a guy to prepare like he's going to pitch in the game. So if, if you're going to use these certain pitches to this part of the plate against lefties and righties and the, these combinations of fastball, slider, changeup, curveball, whatever it may be, go through those routines in the bullpen. Mm. Yeah, you know, take, take your few throws to make sure you're warmed up and, and your body's ready to go. But you can look at the lineup, no matter what level you're at, you can look at the lineup and know who's coming up and who you might face. If you get a couple lefties coming up, what pitches do you use against lefties? Let's, let's make sure those are, are locked in before you get out in the game. Um, you know, certainly at the big leagues, we have much more advanced scouting reports, and we know exactly what we want to do. And so the, the bullpen coach will go through that with a guy as he's warming up. He'll tell him who's up, who's on deck, who he's going to face, give him a quick reminder of, of how we want to attack that particular hitter. Um, but even without that kind of information, 
just knowing what you want to do out in the mound is going to help focus and, and line up your pregame prep. Um, even if it's even if it's a quick you know a quick mid inning call down to the bullpen, you can still know who you're going to face, and and that just having that focus tends to make guys warm up a lot better. You know, great points. Let's take a guy. Let's take someone, um, and we really appreciate your time here. Let's take someone that uh, you don't know. Take a younger player, uh, possibly in travel ball or in high school. You don't know the hitters. Um, what's your recommendation? How to start? And also, possibly, is there something that the hitter gives up that gives you an idea? You know, maybe a stance or some something that gives you an idea how to pitch to him. Maybe you saw him in a previous at bat, or maybe you saw him at BP. Yeah, well, for for the first part, when the guy's warming up, again, just knowing who you are as a pitcher and and the things that you're going to do. If if you don't know who you're going to face, you know nothing about the hitters, but you know that your fastball and curveball are your two best pitches, and this is where you want to use them. Mm -hmm. Make sure those things are dialed in. Like you know, when when all else fails, we're going to fall back on the pitcher strengths. Ah, good. We don't know who's up. If, if we don't know what we're trying to do, we know nothing else. It's understanding yourself and saying, all right, what do I do best? Because I'm still going to rely on my strengths in any situation. So this is what I do best. Let me make sure that I have those couple things ready to go before I get in the game. Now, knowing that when a hitter steps in the box, they give off all kinds of clues. You know, where they stand in the box is a clue. How they react to pitches, um, you know, how they take a pitch tells you one thing. How they react with a foul one off tells you something else. Um, you know, the, the pitches they're willing to swing at tell you what part of the zone they're looking in. Mm. Uh, hit, hitters are willing to chase. That they'll, they'll chase in the part of the zone where they're more active. So if a guy's swinging at the ball inside, he's probably going to chase inside. But if he's leaning out over and, and fighting off a slider down and away, he's probably not going to chase the fastball in because it's so far away from where he's looking. So all those things when it comes to sequencing and, and putting your pitches together, everything a hitter does tells you something. You know, and you talked about we're talking about hitter setup. Um, do hitters set you up as a pitcher? Are they that good? Some of them are. Yep. Some of them are. I, I enjoy the back and forth game. I, I would know, you know, as a pitcher in the big leagues, I knew which hitters were trying to do that. Um, some hitters are, are simply looking at a certain part of the strike zone and they're waiting for you to make a mistake uh, because pitchers make mistakes. Like none of us hit our spots consistently. We all make mistakes. Um, so, you know, some, in some cases, the best hitters have a certain part of the zone they're going to cover and they just never miss it if you if you put it in that part of the zone. And what that does is it forces the pitcher to throw to a much smaller part of the strike zone. Um, that has its own challenges. Other hitters are willing to, to go back and forth where, uh, they're, they're trying to to pick apart what the pitcher is going to throw and and stay one step ahead. Um, again, that comes with experience and, and with knowledge of who you're facing. Uh, but that that back and forth happens a lot, and it's a pretty cool part of the game. I love that. Um, you know, I want to go back a second because you mentioned tunneling, and it was my fault for not bringing it up. Um, tunneling, you know, release having a, a a release point that's pretty close. Is that what tunneling pretty much is? Explain how yeah. you use that. Yeah, that's a starting point. Um, you know, in, in some cases, tunneling is really basic. You know, when when you talk about a a young kid learning how to pitch, the probably the first step is throw a fastball for a strike and then be able to throw a breaking ball out of the strike zone. Um, you know, just by very nature of that, that's that's tunneling. You're, you're tunneling a fastball and a breaking ball that start in the same place and end up in in two different places. Um, so at, at its very nature, it's, it's kind let of me true. quickly ask. Sorry to interrupt. Let me quickly ask on that. If I don't have good biomechanics or movements, the proper movements, my release point's not going to be in the same spot all the time. It's going to vary a lot. Yeah, so so definitely, you're, you're right. A, a key to tunneling is being able to release the ball from the same point every time. If you don't, the hitter's going to know something's different. Mm. So consistency of mechanics and, and being biomechanically efficient and effective is a, a critical first step because the release point has to be the same. Um, so certainly within an inch or so. No one's going to be exactly the same, but... Sure. If I look at pitch data and a guy's got six inches different release point between fastball and changeup or fastball and breaking ball, the hitter's going to be able to see that. Good hitters will see that. Um, so it's it's one of the target points when we first get guys. If, if we look at his pitch data and we see something like that, that's one of the first things we got to fix. Before we worry about the shape of the pitch, we got to get all the pitches to come out of the same place. Um, and from there, we can work on tunneling and, and sequencing and matching pitches up. Excellent. Love it. And is it tough with some players that sometimes they look at their numbers too much? You know, uh, you got to kind of back them off of that a little bit and concentrate on other things like the biomechanics or something else or pitch selection or pitch, excuse me, pitch movement. Up. Sometimes for sure. Yep. Yep. Like I say, each guy's different. Some, some guys love the information and can use it effectively. Some guys love the information, but 
it, it weighs them down rather than helping them. And in those cases, we have to simplify what we give them. It's not that we're hiding information from players, but we're just making sure they focus on the stuff that's actually useful to them. Other guys, honestly, other guys still don't want any info at all. There's not a lot of guys like that, but some guys don't want anything at all. Mm. And they just want me to tell them what to do. Uh, so it, it depends on the guy. But, um, yeah, it's uh, like, like anything else. It's no different than a radar gun. Some guys can look at a radar gun reading and, and they use it because it tells them where their pitches are at. Other guys always want to look at it and are always trying to throw harder and it's not helpful. Um, so, you know, we kind of have to go with the individual guy on that. Absolutely. Dave, we're getting close to the end. I really appreciate it. A couple more things. And then if there's any last minute advice you have for coaches, players, or parents around the world, just mention it. Um, anything you want, because throughout a talk like this, we're going to miss a lot of things. Um, you, I've been told you run, and I don't know if you still do, but you run 10 miles a day. Um, what, what, What's more important, running long distance nowadays, sprints? Is it a combination of both? You know, you hear all the time pitchers. And maybe even after they're done pitching, what's a little routine that you that you can help coaches with to allow them to get better to recover for the next time they pitch? It's definitely shifted from, from how I was taught as a player. Um, for most of my development time and in my career in the big leagues, there was still a lot of focus on distance running, certainly the day after we pitched. Um, you know, I, I run now simply because I like it and it's just kind of a form of exercise. But um, but guys don't run anywhere near as much as they used to. And, and that's probably for the better. I still think there's some benefit to a little bit of distance running. And, and it's not always physical benefit, but there's mental benefit also. Um, you know, the, the the mental toughness and the willingness to do a workout that's tough or that you don't want to do. Yes. That matters. That, that's, that's developing a, a mental skill that is hard to do in other ways. Um so I, I think there's a balance. Um, yes, we, we've shifted more towards the high intensity training and the interval training where there's shorter bursts of, of higher effort. Um, but we also have to make sure that happens over a long enough period of time, because if you're a starting pitcher, you're going to be in the game for two to three hours. Uh, so, you know, five minutes of short sprints is not going to be enough to really build endurance and strength. Um, so we're always working on the power output. We're always trying to get stronger and and maximizing um our velo and our strength, but we also have to be willing to do it over a long period of time. And there's the mental component of, of being able to, to stay mentally strong for five, six, seven, eight, nine innings. You know, and I love that you mentioned the mental part. Um, what about the recovery phase? What do most of your pitchers do after they're done pitching? Uh, there, there's a, they do some shoulder exercises for sure. Uh, there's a fairly lengthy shoulder routine that, that happens with the trainers. Mm -hmm. Um, you know that they're they're constantly being measured um, to to make sure there's no weaknesses anywhere, and then if there are weaknesses, that that affects what kind of recovery we do. So typically, I, I like guys to throw almost every day in the big league schedule. Um, I'm not a huge fan of taking too many days off, uh, but every once in a while, a guy just needs it. Uh, you know, there, there's a weakness or a a small flare up in part of his arm that just requires a day off, and and he needs that day off in order to be able to throw the next day. Um, it's a, a moving target. Always, we, th there's always a plan for guys, and then we, we, and I say we as a, the coaches and trainers and everyone has to be willing to make adjustments along the way, so that um, th the goal is still for a starter to be ready to go on his next start date. You know, and, and if that means sacrificing some effort on the bullpen day, or if that means taking a no throw day in there, then it's worth it. Um, but we're also looking big picture. Too many no throw days are going to cause a problem later on in the season. Mm -hmm. Throwing too much early on will also cause a problem later on. So it's a, a give and take all the time. All right, Dave, two more things. And, you know, we'll kind of blast you with some questions here because it's interesting to hear different aspects of the game. You mentioned the mental aspect, mental toughness, um, you know, about the running. At. Is, is there anything else in training to develop that mental toughness for some of your pitchers? Uh, helping them work through situations. Uh, just, you know, making sure they understand that there's going to be a tough situation in every game. For a starting pitcher, it may be the first inning. The, it may be the first two guys get on, and you've got the three, four, five hitters coming up with two, two on and nobody out. And you know, you may not even realize it yet, but the game might be might be on the line right there in the first inning. And being prepared for that mentally and being ready to face those hitters is a big part of it. Sometimes the focus is on the end of the game. It's on the closer, the setup guy. Uh, it's on the you know the the last inning of the starters out there. But in reality, those tough situations can happen at any point. Um, and you no. never really know, except that you know there's going to be a tough situation somewhere. So I always tell my guys, be prepared for it and be ready whenever you do face that time. 
you know, at the younger levels, I'm not sure we're ever going to figure it out. Um, I tried many years ago, and I still have done it, uh, and I still teach it. You know, before a guy goes into a ball game, he's throwing his bullpen. We try to have a batter up there on both sides, you know, so that way it simulates a little bit more like a game. You know, but you see it a lot of the times. You know, a pitcher gets in a bullpen, and they're in control, and then they go into a game, they can't throw a strike. Um you know, or vice versa. I've seen guys that, you know, can't throw a strike in a bullpen, and then all of a sudden in the game, he turns They're it great. on. It, yeah. Amazing. Uh, can you ever explain that? <laughs> uh, I can't. Uh, <laughs> I wish I could, man. I, it's um, it, it would stump me sometimes as a player and, and sometimes as a coach, too. Um, and I, I try to just separate the two. The, the, the bullpen time is to get your body warmed up and make sure you're ready. All the other work that we've done between starts and in spring training, any other time during the year, is for you to perform in the game. The bullpen itself, the, those 30 or so pitches before the game starts, are, are, should not make or break your performance. Mm. It should be part of the routine and part of the preparation just to get you physically ready to go out there. Um, what you do in the game is going to be more determined by your, your prep work between appearances. Um, you know, Have you conditioned your body properly? Have you gotten the, the right kind of rest? Have you done your scouting reports? Are you fully prepared? Those kind of things are going to make a bigger difference than the bullpen itself. That being said, I do like guys to have a pretty consistent routine in the bullpen. If you typically throw 30 pitches, then let's keep it around 30. If you typically throw 30, but today you threw 50 because you weren't feeling right, it's probably not going to help. So I'd rather guys stick with a pretty consistent routine and trust that all the other work they've done is what's going to make a difference out in the mound. Last question, Dave. What's Dave Bush's routine in the dugout during the game to help your pitchers is what, what, what's your day? What do you do daily? You know, kind of give us an inside look into your work in the, during a, during a ball game at the big league level. Yeah. It's uh, you know, early on, it's pretty casual for, for a starting pitcher. You know, that there's, again, there's a lot of work before the game for myself and for him to make sure he's got the information he wants that we've, we've had our meetings with the catcher and we've gone over the opposing lineup and, and the pitchers had a chance to figure out what he wants to do when he gets out there. Uh, but then the the warm up time and is his time. That, that's his chance to go out there and, and get himself ready and perform. And then early on, you know, I, ideally your starting pitcher is going to give you close to 100 pitches, and so there's some time in, in, in the beginning of the game to kind of let him settle in and, and figure out figure out his routine. Um, but hey, sometimes the starting pitcher gets in trouble early. You know, I, sure. I have to be ready as a coach that I may have to make a visit or, or may have to do something within the first five or ten minutes of the game. Um, so I, in some ways, I'm always ready. Uh, but I'm I'm pretty low key in the dugout. Um, I don't talk with pitchers between every inning. Mm -hmm. If I have something important to say, I will. I'll, I'll go up and say it. Um, some guys want want me to sit down and, and chat with them every time just for a quick recap or or a suggestion. Other guys are are very intense and want to sit by themselves. Um, but but you know I'm like I just intently watch the game and my eyes are all over the field, just trying to see if there's something I can do or something I notice that may make a difference. Fantastic. Dave, I got to believe your psychology major um, has got to help you in what you do. Um, and Andy Berglund's going to kill me if I don't ask this. So, um, no, you know, we like to talk about the development and help coaches and all that. And this could possibly help coaches. But he said you had a great story about Ned Yost. About possibly it's a learning experience. Yeah, yeah. Ned, um, you know, Ned, Ned was great in, in a lot of ways. He, um, he, he was very, very key on um, – on kind of growing us in the big picture and making sure we we're ready for tough situations. Um, you know, that, that he was always making sure we knew that things were going to be tough and that when we got out in the mound, we had to be ready to go. And and there were times that, that Ned took me out of the game and, and I would be mad at him because I wanted to stay in there. But, but I also knew that he was looking at the team's perspective and at the big picture. And, and there was a lot I learned from that about how to, how to, to look beyond myself and, all right, man, what, what do we got in the big picture here? What's going to make the biggest difference for the team long term? And um, and that's that's tough as a player. We, we get so wrapped up in, in ourselves sometimes, and, and not in a bad way, but we're so focused on ourselves. It can be tough to look farther down the road. It can be tough to look to the next inning or the next day or the next start um, and knowing that, that sometimes coaches have to make decisions that are in the best interest long term. Uh, and the players may not agree with that. And I didn't always agree with that as a player, but, but I, I, you know, I see it now from the other side as a coach. Um, but having that relationship with players makes it easier for them to understand why we do the things we do. Fantastic. Any last minute thing for our coaches, players, and parents around the world when it comes to pitching, working with young kids, any last minute advice? No, I think what, what I said earlier about just letting guys throw naturally is really important. 
Um, I see a lot of kids that that have been overcoached when they're little and, and they're so mechanical and so forced that they've lost the feel for what they do naturally. Um, you know, that can be accomplished by a lot of things, by by playing other positions, honestly, by playing other sports, um, by, by spending part of your, your year as a kid doing other things so your athleticism is more well-rounded. Um, and, and then just not pushing guys until they're physically developed. Um, you know, I think there's, there's, uh, there's improvements to be had at all ages. Um, but you know, when, when bodies start to fully mature and fill out, that's when guys can take, really take the next step. Uh, that's when the velo can pick up. That's when the body control gets a lot better. And that's when we see pitchers really develop into actual pitchers instead of just throwers. Um, but look, man, I, I love the game. I love all aspects of it. Um, just like a lot of the people, it kills me that we can't do anything right now. That, that we're all sitting at home and, and you know, wishing we're out in the field. Um, but I also believe that when we get the chance to get back out there, we're all going to be so so thrilled and so happy that it you know, allows us to focus on the parts of the game that we love the most. Absolutely. Dave, thanks for joining us, man. Really appreciate it. Be safe with, with uh, obviously being at home and everything with your family. And like you said, hopefully we'll get back on the field quick here. All right. Thanks, Peter. All right, folks, Dave Bush, Boston Red Sox Major League Pitching Coach. Man, got to thank him so much. That was an outstanding show. I'm Pete Caliendo. I want to thank you for, first of all, joining the show. This is the show which interviews baseball's best coaching minds who love the challenge of status quo. Also, thank you to everybody on Facebook uh, in the U.S. and around the world. You guys are making our show uh, better and better every time. Please spread the show with all your coaches, players, and parents, let them know the education that goes behind here. I want to thank you again. Wish everybody a great coaching day, and we'll see you on the next show. And by the way, the next show in about it's one o'clock Central Time will be former Major League player Victor Cole, born in Russia, the Russian national team coach. So that'll be exciting. You hear what what kind of training they're having. Again, special thanks to Brian Kroc, our producer, the Line of Media Group, and also our guest Dave Bush. See you soon about an hour bye bye